G'day, it's Jamie, and welcome to Where's My Yowie. Today, I'm reading an old newspaper report about a Yowie sighting at Rocky River near Tenerfield in the 1860s, so we'll get into it. This was published in the Clarence and Richmond Examiner and New England Advertiser on Saturday, the 31st of July, 1880, titled Myth or Monster. There are a great many persons disposed to laugh at the reports which have been circulated as to the appearance of a creature not hitherto described between the watershed of the Clarence and Maclay. Not knowing personally any parties who have spoken of having seen it, I cannot offer any opinion of the value of their testimony, but may say in passing that others who do know them are perfectly satisfied with their credibility. It of course does seem strange if any such animal exists in our ranges or mountain scrubs that more has not been seen or heard of it by diggers and timber getters, the former of whom are noted for exploring in their quest of precious minerals in all sorts of inaccessible places. Still, I doubt not there are many objects of natural history existing in out-of-the-way localities which have escaped the notice of such observers and may yet be known to naturalists. Attaching credence to the circumstantial descriptions of this animal, which by the way have not yet fully been published, I am inclined to believe it is some lucis naturae or freak of nature. There are many who have travelled about a good deal and still have not seen such things as white kangaroos, white dingoes or black possums not to mention such monstrosities as snakes with two heads, bullocks with six legs, horses without hair, etc, etc. <coughs> Allowing for a slight discrepancy in the description and the variation after all not being such a very good departure from a wallaroo, we might not have to go any further for the solution. There remains however another theory that is, it is a perfectly new animal. There is nothing inconsistent even in this, or the possibility of a few solitary specimens of some almost extinct race of animals being yet to be found in the dense brushes of our mountain ranges. It is now a pretty well accepted fact that at the time of Cook's first visit to the New Zealand coast, specimens of the moa were still to be found on the island, and it has thought not beyond the bounds of probability that a living specimen might yet be discovered. True, no fossils have been found in our land corresponding with the creature lately seen, but many fossils have been unearthed, telling of animals once existing on our shores of which there is not the vestige of tradition even to be learnt from the Aboriginal inhabitants of the soil. It is somewhat remarkable that the story now in circulation corroborates very closely with what the Aborigines many years ago used to declare existed in the ranges between Rocky River, Timbara and the Clarence. If I was perfectly sure the modern yarn was not founded on what the Aborigines used to tell, I would take the one to be strongly corroborative of the other. This animal they called Jerawara and described it as a biped about the size of a small woman walking erect and using its hands and arms as a human being. It was very rarely seen and they did not care about going near its haunts. The latter statement may be readily accepted. They further describe the Jerawaras as living in caves and as ready to an attack whenever they saw them. They also described them as slow in their gait and covered with hair. No value 
would ever tempt the boldest of them to promise to bring in a baby one. It would not appear that many Aborigines had seen these animals, but every man, woman and child nonetheless solemnly believed in them. And it was very amusing to cast a doubt upon their existence from the fact of their not being able to produce a specimen as they could of kangaroos or other animals. They would invariably ask me to go to such and such a place and see for yourself, and I would then believe. About 10 years ago, I had a visit from a squatter upon New England, a man who has been all his life in the bush, and who, if I were to mention his name, it would serve as a guarantee anywhere for the authenticity of his assertions. It may be inferred he had seen all and known all animals of common occurrence throughout the district. And I may add, he was not of a temperament or of habits likely to conjecture imaginary beings from an overheated brain. We had been talking of Aboriginals and their statements in regard to various matters. And I asked him if he had heard about Jerawarras. He replied, Oh yes, often from an old Aboriginal man that I knew well, he then added. I believe I saw one myself. The fact as related to me amounted to this. He was travelling to his own place. The sun had set and night was closing in, but there was sufficient light to observe objects at a considerable distance. His track lay through a pretty rough, unfrequented country, and just about this time he had to descend a hill for about three or four hundred yards, at the foot of which was a small creek with tangled scrub round and about it. When about halfway down, his horse pricked its ears and exhibited unusual signs of interest in something ahead. This caused him to look particularly in that direction, and he saw what at the moment he took to be an Aboriginal man walking among the bushes. Thinking he was stalking some animal, he kept his eyes upon him as he approached. When, within about 40 yards, it quickly turned round and, after gazing with astonishment at the man and horse, it rushed into the scrub that lined the creek and was no more visible. The squatter had no doubt in his mind about it being an Aborigine until it turned around. It had occurred to him, in the few yards he was allowed to approach, that it was not big enough for an Aboriginal man, that it must have been one of the women looking for something they had dropped. He says it was of low stature, not four feet high at the outside. It was not a human being, and yet resembled no Australian animal so much as humankind. He added, if it was not a Jerawara, he did not know what else to call it, and either even after that evening, believed there was something more in the Aboriginal's tales other than mere fancy. He never subsequently saw it, although frequently travelling over the same country, and said it would be ever a mystery to him. The Aborigines at the station, when told of it, immediately pronounced it to be a Jerawara. Some years subsequently, I was told by a stockman on one of the outlying station that a party of diggers who had gone to prospect in one of the creeks heading near the tableland cleared out very precipitately. They had got capital prospects, but one night's camping satisfied them and they struck their tent the next morning. It appeared they had a very ferocious dog with them, nearly a pure bred bulldog. He was out and scarred all over from fights with native dogs, any number of whom he would tackle, and he had single-handedly killed scores in their travels. 
This dog, which they had never known to betray signs of fear, had made a charge into the bush, but came back very quickly, showing signs that he had got a fright and slunk into the tent with abject fear. And no amount of coaxing or bullying would have induced him to forsake the friendly shelter of the canvas. He had not as much as a scratch on him. The biped saw nothing, and what the quadruped saw, he could not tell. But the diggers concluded there must have been something awfully uncanny abroad that night so to affect their dog. They made tracks the next day, as I have said, and never returned, but had no hesitation in telling the plain reason for their clearing out so unceremoniously. I cannot tell how the truth may be. I say the tale as it is said to me. It is possible there are many other facts which might be got throughout the district in support of the theory of some strange animal to be found as lately described. I have never gone out of my way to ascertain from others what they know, or perhaps a great deal of might might have been elicited. I confess I have heard many things which needed to be taken come grano salus, and have not therefore mentioned them. Someone else knowing the facts more positive than I have stated maybe led to their, them known whether in confirmation or refutation, we would like to be alike acceptable to me. Old hand, the end. Well, that's a really interesting story from um, this guy was telling about how he saw the um, Yowie as he was riding on his horse in nearly darkness and he thought it was an Aboriginal guy at first until it turned around and then it's like, he says it wasn't a human being, but it looked like a it looked like a human, which is really interesting. And then when the they were talking about the Jerawaras, they're saying they lived in caves, and they were ready to come out and attack you if you got near them. And then they were like they offered uh, the Aboriginals m money to go and get a baby one, and no one would take them up on it, which I don't blame them one bit. And then it was interesting with the prospectors, how they had the ferocious dog with them. And they're like, it could kill dingoes and all that, wasn't scared of anything. And he come running back. It had got a fright and come running back from the bush. And obviously the guys got a bit of a fright as well, but they didn't mention that in their story. Anyway, that's it for me. I'll get back to you all next time. Bye.